Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my Grandmaster Round Robin campaign. Um, this is a tournament which has 10 uh, players in it. It's, uh, it's a group section, so I know all of my pairings beforehand. And this is the first recap. Y'all really enjoyed the video that I made uh, hyping up the tournament. I appreciate all your comments. Uh, this time, the background is this unbelievably bright lamp. Please tell me if it's distracting and I will turn it off for future recaps. Let's just jump right into this game. So, a little bit of backstory with Grandmaster Mark Paragua. I played him, uh, uh, this is not the game, but I played him a couple of years ago, and we played a Grunfeld defense. And in that game, I played a sideline, and I thought I had surprised him. But he counter-surprised me, and a couple of moves after we were done surprising each other, we traded all of our pieces, and the game ended in a draw, in like 12 moves. I didn't want it to end in a draw, but it did. So d4. Now I spent about 85% of my time preparing the King's Indian defense. I looked at his games and recently in his online games, he's been playing 90% King's Indian defense. So I was ready. I was ready to detonate something, but I knew in the back of my mind that he could go back to the Grunfeld defense and he did. And I came prepared with a line uh, that I had never in my life played before, not even in Blitz. So living a little bit dangerously. And he does play the Grunfeld. So playing straight into his preparation. So Bishop f4 castles and here normally white plays e3 and black will try to either take on c4 or just smash the center with c5 this is very common grunfeld stuff but i don't want to get into a gunfight with a guy who knows how to wield a gun and i can barely use a sharp object you know what i'm saying i don't have experience in this so uh coach shout out to Wojciech miranda my coach sent me this file on rook c1 and this line is very safe for white it completely discourages c5 it plays against the main idea and the point is that by putting the rook on c1 you stabilize your knight there's a lot of counterplay associated with putting the queen on a5 in the grunfeld to try to team up with the bishop and this is already just prepared the knight is guarded so you can just take the second pawn in the center and you're completely fine and my line here went bishop e6 or he can take on c4 first like this I chase his bishop, he sticks around in the center defending his pawn, I move my e-pawn again because it's guarded by both knights, attacks his bishop, if his bishop just moves away, um, then I take my pawn back with my bishop and I just storm him forward in the center. Uh, so he has to go here, I take, he takes, I take, he takes, I take, and for a brief moment material balance has been restored, he of course should not play this move because that just helps me restructure my center. And he plays knight here and bishop back. And at this point, I knew two moves. Number one, Maxim Vashelagrov in the past has played the move queen takes d4 and the move knight to c6. And my prep here completely ended with the move knight back to e2, which looks like it doesn't actually protect this pawn, but it does. And it's sort of the other idea of rook c1 is the fact that that pawn behind the knight is always going to be weak. So if my opponent ever played knight takes d4, this is simply too dangerous because, for example, what happens after everything flies off the board? My rook gets in and just eats everybody. Full, full Pac-Man mode with rook c7, right? So I play knight e2, I sit back, I'm like, all right, cool. I have no idea what, like, nothing. Uh, I remember two moves in my notes, knight to uh, a5 and a5 to play a4. That's it, that's all I remembered. Uh, he thinks for like maybe eight, nine minutes, he plays queen d7. I'm like, okay. So now what? Now I'm completely on my own. Let's, it's time to outplay a grandmaster, right? So I start thinking. Oh, by the way, you guys like my bracelet? I saw Mike Klein from Chess Kid, and uh, he gave me a bracelet. It's a neon green bracelet. Hopefully it distracts my opponent Tsuh, in the future. I don't think it distracted this guy. So he plays queen d7. I'm like, what's the idea of queen d7? All right, so he obviously wants to put a rook behind, right? Uh, maybe he also wants to get out of the pin and push an e-pawn, and he wants to venture over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now what? Start thinking. I'm like, okay. I have a couple of ideas. Um, I'm not I'm never really gonna go d5. This is idiotic because he wants to get my bishop. This is part of his counterplay. My bishop is the best piece on the board, so he wants to get rid of it. What do I want? I'm like, all right, well, what if I just castle? Then I'm like, all right, what if I don't castle? What if I just, you know, you leave a super GM or computer unattended, they're always gonna play h4. Now I have I have actually seen the move h4 in similar situations. I looked at h4 and I was like, I kind of don't get it. What if he goes a5? If I play h5, then he just goes a4. 
Like, I don't know. Th now my bishop's getting kicked off. This I can't just take. I, it looks scary. It looks scary, but there's nothing there. There's rule of plus two. Need two more attacking pieces than defenders? I don't have that. I have two. He has one. Not going to work. So I'm like, okay. So it turns out, and I kind of just discarded H4. I was like, that move looks stupid, and I don't wanna I don't wanna be stupid in like the first 15 moves of round one of my tournament. Computer likes it! Computer thinks that H4 is the best move! Can you believe it? Oh, I've I've analyzed with Stockfish 13 on kind of a low depth. Yeah, so it just basically isn't afraid of the bishop getting attacked. The engine's like, yeah, come and get me. Come and get me. I'm still gonna play H5. And I was like, and you know what the computer wants after a move like rook d8? It wants white. I'm not even joking. There, it, it, it's, it's starting to suggest moves like king f1. So, for example, if like the queen comes to g4, which, again, I did say is part of the game plan, king to f1. Unbelievable. The craziest thing is I looked at something like this, and I didn't discard it for a tangible reason. I just said, that looks really fucking stupid. All right? I don't curse a lot on YouTube, but that... That just looks really dumb. Why would I do this? And the computer just is like, oh, yes, of course, you must play like this. Oh, moronic human. Anyway, um, parents, if you're watching with your children, sorry, but they were going to learn the F word anyway. I was like, this just looks so dumb. So I just decided to castle. Okay, he plays rook d8. And here I spent like 20 minutes because I couldn't figure out the difference between two queen moves. Here and here. Okay, I couldn't figure them out. Here's my logic. If I play queen to d3, I have a very direct threat. My very direct threat is to take this pawn on g6 because it's pinned, right? Now, if he were to play knight to a5 in this position, I was calculating just sliding my bishop back. And basically my game plan, like let's just, um, it's kind of hard to just give black a random move. Like let's say he just keeps coming forward. If he keeps moving forward, I don't actually need to protect my b2 pawn. I, actually, like, I'm not afraid of losing it. For instance, I'm just going to play a random move. Knight b2 is not scary because he wastes so much time venturing to my queen side where there's nothing happening, and I'll rotate over, go here, and all of a sudden I'm going to have all my pieces involved in an attack on the king. It's a very complex position, but it's not something that's super scary. But I couldn't figure out, I was like, what if he doesn't do that? Like, I don't know, what if he, like, goes here? You know, am I gonna go bishop b1? Like, am I just gonna slow play this? And the engine is like, yeah, you probably should do this and try to... It, it's just a complex game. Now, I was looking at queen d3 for a long time, but that's not the only plan he has. He can also, like, trade queens with me, for example. He can also play this move, queen g4, and that looks interesting and attacks everything, but check this out. I have a counter shot. Kabam! Kabam! And if he takes, I take this, and hello, that's a, that's a fork. I'm getting one of the rooks back. So here, here, queen e2, queen takes g6, pinned, and the game can end in a draw here. With check, king h8. Oh, wait, I don't even have queen h5. Oh, I just go here. Of course, I'm... I'm yeah, okay. I mean, I, I didn't see anywhere near this far in my analysis, but th this is kind of what I'm saying. Like, this is... I, I mean, I was looking at queen d3 for a very long time. And the second thing I looked at was, well, he wants knight a5, right? So what if I just play queen d2? And the idea of queen to d2 is very simple. I want to go rook d1 and maybe bishop h6. And yes, this is being attacked four times. He still cannot take with the knight. It's too dangerous to take with the knight because c7 is always under pressure. And if he does this, like, God bless him, but he's not going to survive. I'll move my queen. I'll move this. I'm down one pawn but every piece I have is playing in the game. You understand? Like, every, look at this. This is, this is like vintage two bishop compensation. So here, he thought for like 40 minutes, no, like 36 minutes, on the only move that he has, basically, with the exception of maybe a5, a4. He can, he can once again go back to trying to play this flank pawn push. And I was like, okay, well, he's thinking for 40 minutes, he's obviously not going to play this move because he would have just played this move right away. It's the only move in the position. He thinks for like 36 minutes and he just, he just takes. He takes and here he does something which was so annoying, he offered me a draw. And let me tell you something, folks. I am committed to not taking short draws in closed Grandmaster round robin events, okay? Um, the reason for that is, you know, there's all this controversy with these titles and everything and um now like fide is trying to change the rules a little bit make it a little bit harder i don't want to go to these events and take like short draws i want to fight in every game unless the situation demands it he offered me a draw i proceeded to think for about 45 minutes myself i thought from like no no not 45 sorry like 30 30 like 30 minutes 
And this is what I was calculating. Number one, if I take the bishop, I just take the bishop. I just take it, right? So again, he really shouldn't take with the queen because I'll sidestep. I won't trade with him and I'm just a pawn down, but everything in his position is a target forever, right? Including this. The other thing that I was thinking about was knight takes d4 and I couldn't find the way forward here. He told me after the game, he thought that if I just chill with a move like queen e3, even in a position like this, he felt his position was unpleasant because he is so passive. That is what he thought. That is why he offered me the draw, not because, I mean, he's a grandmaster. He's, he's trying to beat me. I'm the lower rated player, lowest rated player in the tournament, right? So you got to beat me. So he thought I would take and play queen e3, just slow play the position. I thought here to play queen c2. The idea of this move is to target this. Now he should probably defend himself with king to g7, and I was thinking to slide over and just pressure him, but I did not know what to do after queen to g4 now. I didn't know. I had no idea. None. Zero. And the engine here shows at this point I have only one move where I'm not worse, and I gotta go for this, and I saw this, and what happens if e5 computer... Uh, you just take the bishop, and now he can't take with the knight because this is check. So you have a gigantic trade, and it's still equal. So, so, queen c2 is what I was thinking about for a long time. But it, he can even do this. He can even play queen f5. And for example, take, take, he can even sack this rook, I think. I actually think there are some lines he could potentially sacrifice this rook, as long as he's getting my second pawn. And so, folks, that's all to say that after bishop takes d4 and a 30-minute thought, I took the draw. Because he didn't like his position. I didn't like my position. I, I mean, that's like a very extreme way of saying it. We both were unsure what the future held. We both thought that the position was pretty unclear. And I listened to my coach. My coach before the tournament told me exactly in situations like this one, um, don't, you don't need to win at all costs. You are the lowest rated player in the tournament by an average rating of by, by an average of about a hundred points. The average rating of the field without me is like twenty four seventy. So it's a tough tournament, and um, this is a decent start. And the way you learn from a game like this is you go and uh, you start filling in the gaps. Rather than playing the sideline, I will then learn e3 or I will learn a different line of the Grunfeld. Or I will play c4, which can avoid the Grunfeld because there's no pawn to d4. The reason why I didn't play c4 is because he could play something else. And now we're some you know we're in totally different territory i was banking on the fact that he was going to play a king's indian defense and i had something prepared like i said i spent like 80 90 percent of my time preparing a king's indian and the rest filling it in with this grunfeld line uh which was going to just give me a very easily playable position and it did it was just very confusing and we took a draw like three moves later so that is what i've learned from this game a decent start to my event the good news i'm not going to lose every game that i play the bad news, I still have eight games to lose every game that I play. But the good news is that that's not going to happen. Very quick recap here for the first game. Uh, love you all, and if you made it this far in the review, then you are amazing. And uh, I'll see you for round two tomorrow. Get out of here!